Many have blamed the impact of market forces in education. But equally important seems the widespread loss of faith in what education sets out to do, or any agreement, or perhaps even understanding about what, these, uh, what the schools and universities should teach. Today, few would defend the achievements of the past and the need for young people to master the building blocks of their culture. In such a climate, purpose, perhaps the very idea of standards for education makes little sense. This session will ask where the impetus to water down education come from. In the order of the speakers, um, I would like to welcome Penny Lewis, lecturer, University of Dundee, author of Ar Architecture and Collective Life. She's from the UK. I will stress here the different countries because I think that would be important to the discussion also for the audience uh, to be aware which areas of the world we're discussing and then to prepare the questions for the last part of the session. Jean-Pierre Brigelli, teacher, essayist, school reformer from France. And here I have to stress also a troublemaker big time. So I'm really looking forward to his contribution. Um, Janos Sentene, director of MCC Learning Institute from Hungary. And here I would be really pleased to hear the position of the Central and Eastern Europe. I think it's very important to, to stress and to contrast, but also be aware of dangers coming our way. Um, as a Polish person, I can attest to that. And Jonathan Butcher from USA, Heritage Foundation. Uh, so here I think it would be worth to dissect where a lot of the issues that we're dealing with are coming from and then maybe look for the solutions together. So um, just to prepare you for the structure, um, we, we are quite good on time, so I think seven to 10 minutes max. Um, I will probably signal to you if we're coming to, to, to the end of your time. And then we will have um, around 20, 30 minutes for conversation between you and I will be trying to make sure that you are challenged. And uh, then I open for the questions from the floor and I hope you all will be engaged and especially the young people. I'm going to pay close attention to you and your questions and comments. So um, Penny, would you like to start please? Thank you. Okay, so I'm coming from the UK, but I'm coming from a very particular uh, place on the edge of the United Kingdom, from Scotland. Um, and it's important to recognize that because um, while in England there has been some uh, response by government to parental pressure on some of these issues, in Scotland I, we unfortunately are at the sort of uh, whole face of a progressive movement, a government that is an independent nationalist government, which doesn't seem to be that keen on independence or nationalism, but is very keen to put a distance between itself and central government in Westminster. So it will adopt pretty um, unmanageable policies on a regular basis if it can tag those policies as progressive. Um, and so we have a very particular set of conditions in Scotland. So I'm talking to you uh, from a position of uh, a group of people in Scotland that have set up something called the Scottish Union for Education. It's for parents and grandparents and teachers and, and people more broadly uh, within the community. And it was set up almost on instinct against um, indoctrination. There was a kind of impulse, particularly among parents, who initially were seeing government um, introducing things like explicit sex surveys, asking children very particular information at a relatively young age about their sexual experience. And then it developed into a campaign that was trying to challenge um, the promotion of gender ideology in schools. And it's now in a position whereby um, parents are regularly in contact with each other and attempting to establish frameworks for discussion, uh, really to challenge, um, well, initially to challenge two things, um, but, but more broadly to challenge the question of declining standards. So the union began as a campaign really to challenge the idea that schools and government should have policy which affirms the idea that children can be born in the wrong body. Um, and secondly, to challenge the idea um, that the school is um, really the best institution to protect 
the rights of the child. And particularly this was in relation to gender ideology, where it is in Scotland official government policy um, to keep the fact that a child might be socially transitioning from a girl to a boy away from parents that are likely to be unsympathetic to that transition. And that's a very significant uh, thing in terms of uh, government policy underpinning this idea that there must be secrecy and, and the parents shouldn't know what's happening to their child in school. So that's the Scottish Union for Education. Uh, we produce a weekly substack which brings together a whole range of parental and grandparental experience which you should uh, find if you go to the substack site. But the thing that I've been asked to talk about is falling standards. <coughs> If you look at the UNESCO PISA results, you'll see that uh, Scotland's results are very poor and declining rapidly, <coughs> and declining s consistently, particularly uh, in relation to science and maths, but also in relation to, to reading. But I think more poignant in a way than what PISA tells us, which is really quite a technical reading and can often be read as seen as a, a, a problem of funding and a problem of resources, is the kind of feedback we're getting from teachers at um, Scottish Union for Education. A couple of weeks ago, we had a letter from a head teacher um, talking about the English curriculum. And he said he had been in an old bookshop and he picked up a book from the 1950s which was kind of symptomatic of the quality of Scottish education. And he said it was interesting because it gave guidance to teachers as to how to use uh, this poetry book. And at the beginning, it called the, the uh, children scholars. So first of all, uh, in Scottish education in the past, there was an idea that when you came into education, you were a scholar that you wanted to study uh, the scholarship of the world. And he said, I'm not allowed to call children scholars now. In fact, I'm not even allowed to call them students and, and pupils. I'm always asked to call them young people. And I think this kind of transformation of language of the way in which um, schools are asked to operate in Scottish schools is quite significant. He then said, in this book, there were 203 poems, and children in the last two years of uh, English education were expected to read all 203 poems. This is 1950. He compared that to National Five, which is the exit award in English uh, at the moment. He said they read one poem, one poem to assess uh, their understanding and appreciation uh, of English. And because in assessment they read one poem, in the school life they read one poem. So this institution of teaching to the test is really profound. He then went on to look at what you had to do as an exit award. 37% is the pass mark for English in, in Scottish schools. So you have to achieve 37% in order to get a pass grade at National 5. And uh, within that 37%, 30% is a folio, which is something that you do at home. And that something you do at home is a 300-word biography, which could be taken off Wikipedia, of a footballer or a pop star, or a short poem, so <laughs> a few hundred words. And you could tell while he was talking there was an incredible sense of loss in terms of what he was handing on uh, to Scottish children, and this is becoming systematically part of the way um, that education is going. Uh, the, the decline in English standards is really important. Why are standards falling is the big question which is raised. For Scotland, I mean, I think there are general reasons and there are specific reasons. For Scotland, I think we have a specific problem. We've had 25 years of devolution, which basically means a weak government uh, with little sense of purpose. And we've had 15 years on top of that of education reform. The education reform, which is known as the Curriculum for Excellence, is definitely not excellent, and it's not really a curriculum. It's a series of directions that are given uh, to schools by central government, really grounded in psychology, uh, more than learning and the body of human knowledge, quite often evidence-based in that they refer um, to brain science, not educational traditions. But at its heart, it's the idea of affirmation. 
the idea that the role of the teacher is not to challenge the student, uh, but is firm to affirm, constantly to affirm in all, in all cases how the student feels. So this is our primary problem. Our secondary problem relates to the point that Frank made at the beginning about counterculture. Particularly in Scotland, there's a sense that all previous knowledge is problematic. We have a kind of post-colonial light ideology that exists in Scotland, that anything to do with the United Kingdom or the history of the United Kingdom um, is needs to be discredited and we should... Um, we should abandon uh, everything we knew about the past. That even goes, it's so corrosive that even a government led by a Scottish nationalist party can't handle its own national poet, Rabbi Burns. We had Rabbi Burns' night very relatively recently, and the press were full of discussions about the misogyny of Rabbi Burns rather than looking at the possibility of celebrating equality and universalism that's embedded in his poetry. So the second thing is that we have this counterculture problem. We also, thirdly, have a problem that um, it's become institutional now for teachers, and I myself am a teacher at university, it's the same problem in schools. There's a problem that we're anti-didactic. There's a belief that teachers don't have anything really um, to teach children. We talk all the time about teaching and learning, and you have to have both of those components. You're never allowed to have teaching uh, standing by itself. And in, in lots of ways, you can see it in schools um, that teachers' authority is um, being undermined. And finally, the fourth point, why are we in this terrible situation in Scotland? Um, I really liked Jacob's point about not introducing children to the world uh, in, a, in a structured way. Well, one of the reasons Sue started is because um, schools were talking to children about sex in a really um, unage appropriate way. But I think that's a metaphor for the whole way that education is, is structured and organized at the moment. Lots of teacher trainers don't really seem to be taught the fact that you should introduce knowledge and an understanding of the world and reality uh, in stages. So we have reports of nursery schools coming from parents where nursery children are asked to refer to staff in terms of their pronouns. We have reports from primary school children where boys are disciplined and uh, held up for potential official uh, legal um, issues for calling each other black and brown when they are actually black or brown. Um, and we have across the schools a sense that parents report all the time that children are not being exposed to the wealth of literature that exists, but being given really terrible books to read. <laughs> and we have a massive campaign, uh, which parents are really enthusiastic about, to put the really great things of children's literature uh, back on the agenda. In other words, a lack of age appropriateness means that we're closing down um, children's um, joy and appreciation uh, and understanding of the world by exposing them uh, to all of the wrong things at the wrong times. Jean-Paul Brighelli, please. Well <laughs> I'm sure you're going to be excellent. Thank you. I learned English 60 years ago, so I'm a little rusted, you know. <laughs> so, dear fellows, I'm really glad to be there. I've written many books uh, on the teaching of ignorance that characterize school all over Europe, particularly France. A great country uh, now collapsing. Too many books. But I'm known for one title, La Fabrique du Crétin. Uh, how could I translate it? Uh, Dumps Factory or The Plant of the Idiot. Uh, the subtitle was The Planned Death of School, meaning the apocalypse was premeditated. Uh, school is not dysfunctioning. That's really important. Uh, current disorder were calculated. This is the school of a new order. Uh, it was 18 years ago. 18 years ago. It was a huge success. 130,000 
art cover. I was congratulated by many people, people hearing without listening. Uh, maybe you remember the sound of silence. It didn't change anything. One book, many books, don't change anything. Meanwhile, I wrote many other books about teaching. I'm going to try to give you a digest of all of them in six minutes. I can do it. Uh, the repudiation of knowledge had many ways, but only one reason. The desire, encored in the mind of Jean Monnet and others European founding fathers, to destroy nations. Remembrance of two world wars or submission to the decision of his American friends, I don't mind. Afterwards, a bunch of European technocrats accomplished their dream. In 1999, in Lisbon, they decided to highlight competencies and skill of our knowledge. It was not a conspiracy, but a consequence. The system built the school it, it needed. Then the European school system touched the abyss, but they dig again and again. The empty heads of children are valuable for superstition, fanatism, and consumerism of false news and other byproducts. My next books will explain the responsibilities of teachers in the making of terrorists. I think I will gain many friends. <laughs> there are two domains which suffered greatly of this decision, the mastering of elaborated language and the history of nations. I shall not elaborate on the inconvenient of not knowing where you come from. Europe wants uh, one people, just one people. Look at the banknote they imposed to print the euro. Bridges and open doors, uh, symbols and metaphors, I presume, uh, of openness. But not real bridges, not real architectures. Uh, no more great men, no writers, no painters, no artists. The common knowledge is the knowledge of nothing and nobody. The past is dead in the empty head of modern pupils. For them, history begins the day of their birth. They don't even know the words to tell the present. Far away from the language of great writers we learned for decades, the people now speak the language of the street, which is not a language at all. Of course, they are no more able to read great classic books. A classic is a book always modern. We said it yesterday. The new teachers, tailored by theoricians of pedagogy, we could usually dismiss. Or oh, my personal choice would be to send them in the rice fields in the south of France. Uh, are often no more able to set things right. They have not the minimal knowledge, and we all know we teach with knowledge, no good intentions. They think, as Jean-Jacques Rousseau told them, that the child is good. That society and school corrupt him. We know that the child is twisted and that real education is an anti nature. Uh, the known to, to name the teachers of the first years in French is instituteur. It is rooted in the Latin verb stare, to stand up. That was the core of the job for several centuries. It's a thing of the past. Now, all over Europe, the child is at the center of the system, as they say. He is free to say anything coming in his mind, stereotype, basically. Pythagore asked his students to stay silent for five years until they found a good question. Great idea. <laughs> we need a new deal to give the pupils of tomorrow, I say tomorrow because I consider today is already dead, the pride to be themselves instead of listening to the speeches of hate coming from overseas. And in Marseille, where I live, that's a really deep uh, question. Emptiness and dumbness always generate, generate hate and the beginning of the end. The suicide of Europe began at school. Our resurrection will come from school. Otherwise, the Western civilization is dead. Thank you for listening. Thank you for fighting. Thank you. Janos, please. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I was asked to, to provide a Central European uh, picture about this situation. So I, I must be um, a revolting person. Standards are not declining. 
in Central Europe. But the comparison is not fair. One thing we never talk quite seriously and openly enough is that we are educating our children. So in a Polish classroom, the teachers and the children share the same cultural heritage. In Poland, they are teaching Polish children. In Hungary, with the Roma minority, including, of course, we are teaching our children, and these countries so far avoided mass migration. So it's, it's, it's different, you understand? That? The older ones can, can still remember, like Sweden in the 60s, where Swedish teachers were teaching Swedish children. So it's a not a fair comparison. Uh, I have some evidences that uh, standards are not declining. Number one is that uh, in the international uh, uh, student uh, Olympiads, mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, or children, the Central Europeans, usually harvesting the gold, silver, and bronze medals. Actually, China is leading, of course, but we are still in a very strong position there. Uh, we have very, very talented kids all over the system. The second is um, that some Western European countries still provide tuition-free generous uh, access to higher education, like Denmark, the Netherlands, or Scotland. Uh, thank you for my son, the eldest son. Um, and uh, they have a chance to create a good mix of uh, international students, and uh, the Central Europeans are over, way over, over represented. Why? Because if you get a Czech, a Slovak, a Hungarian, or a Pole, you get a highly educated, disciplined person ready to work seriously in a university, and a person who respects the academic persons. That's very easy for them, and it improves the quality of the student mix. Um, and the third one is, is MCC, where I work regularly with my students, and they are not worse than we were, we have been uh, some decades ago. So standards are not declining, but we are living in one global village, so of course global things are influencing us. One is the general barbarization of youth culture, of course, but I want to emphasize one thing, this is not a pedagogical issue, and it's not just an educational issue. So once they return home, they switch on Netflix and other things, and they get directly this barbarian uh, and non-European culture, uh, it destroys <laughs> the hard work of the morning in the school. That's a dilemma, of course, that we are building something in the morning, and it is destroyed by these uh, digital channels in the afternoon, but this is not an educational problem, and this problem cannot be solved in the school, okay? But we can uh, achieve some equilibrium. The second issue is, of course, the expansion of education. There are no jobs for young people. That's sociology of education. So we have to keep them longer and longer in education. Uh, that is uh, the cause of demoralization of the classroom. Of course, they know that um, it's not a really uh, risky business uh, to avoid serious work because they will go to higher education anyway. We have young barbarians in the universities. It was different 20 years ago. Uh, nevertheless, um, standards are not declining yet, sometimes improving, actually. Uh, what is more important is, uh, is, is a cultural phenomenon that namely our elites uh, all over Europe are losing faith in the ideal purpose of education. Nobody is talking about the ideals of education. Uh, curriculum policy was, in the previous decades, uh, pretty much in Central Europe, formed and discussed around the output, the ideal uh, of educated persons. Now it's more pragmatic, economic, uh, so the level of discussion is uh, getting lower in Central Europe as well. Uh, skills and competences are more often quoted in these uh, discussions and negotiations. Um, I want to uh, finish my short uh, contribution with a dilemma that can we reverse this cultural decline? Um, uh, Lech Wałęsa, this famous Polish uh, uh, leader of Solidarność, Solidarity Movement, once he told when he was talking about the difficulty 
to transform a communist society back to a flourishing democracy and market economy, that everybody knows how to make a fish soup from a living fish, but it's very difficult to transform the fish soup back to a living fish. We have done it <laughs> in the past 30 years. We are living fishes from fish soup, where communi communism was not a feast. And um, as a historian, I have uh, one example how to do it. In this cultural war, we cannot convince every parent. It's impossible, and we cannot convince every student. But let's make an example of counter-reformation and the Jesuits. Europe was uh, covered by Protestantism. Sorry for Protestants, we love them, okay? And um, the Catholic case was lost uh, around uh, 1,600. Then the Jesuits came, who on one hand tried to copy the Protestants and established schools for the people, but they made something else. Uh, they also contacted uh, the local leaders, decision makers, leading cultural figures, aristocrats, uh, the, the model personalities of, the, of that societies, and they tried to, to, to turn them back uh, to Catholics because they knew one very important thing, that most people follow uh, the leading figures. Every society needs model persons, and if they are turned back to, towards the European civilization, towards Western civilization at its best, then other people slowly will follow. You don't have to convince everybody on the street, but you have to convince some leading figures who will show the example. That is the Jesuit lesson of counter-reformation. Now the question is that who will be our new Jesuits? And uh, one warning I can tell you, Central Europe cannot save Western Europe. We don't have the potential for that, but we can maintain European civilization and good education for at least one or two decades more. Uh, that is time. We can win some time and we can start the work of uh, reculturalization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jonathan? Thank you and good morning and, and thank you to those who are not from the English-speaking world for delivering your remarks in English. It's better than many K-12 students in the U.S. would do with their English, so well done. And that's the problem, isn't it? Um, in the United States, the challenge in education has been recognized really going back to the 1960s. Uh, and I would argue that the, the problem, and so to address the question of this panel is, why are civics in decline, or why are standards in particular in decline? I would argue it's because of the increasing prevalence and activity of a centralized government over what should be a local issue in the United States. And that began really in Lyndon Johnson's administration. But even in 1983, when Ronald Reagan was president, they released a report called A Nation at Risk. I mean, they knew in 1983, three years after the creation of the U.S. Department of Education, which is the federal agency that oversees from Washington, D.C., education in the United States. They called it at risk. That report now is more than 40 years old. It's 40 years old. Scores today, and we have something in the U.S. called uh, the nation's report card, and there's a long-term trend of student scores among 17-year-olds, so those who are finishing high school in the U.S., their scores have remained flat since the 1970s. No improvement in math and reading among students who are graduating high schools uh, in the US. So the problem may have started with an increasing involvement of a centralized government in the US, but I'm gonna fast forward now and I will say what the problem is today. What the problem is today is clearly an ideological one. The problem today has been the rise of what you know, may be called in the West, we will call it wokeness. You can trace its origins to the Frankfurt School and to Marxism coming out of uh, Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. But 
landed in the U.S. at Columbia University in 1937 and was, pro- you know, it developed there and is now sadly what the United States appears to be exporting around the world. But I will tell you that there are those resisting it in the U.S. There are those who are pushing back. Uh, my book, um, Splintered, Critical Race Theory and the Progressive War on Truth, talks about that and what that resistance in the U.S. looks like. But let me focus in, not in the 1960s, 70s, or 80s, but really over the last 15 years, in the few minutes that I have with you, about standards in the U.S. and why there has been a particularly sharp turn uh, in the wrong direction about not just student achievement, but the expectations for students in the U.S. So, like I said, math and reading scores have been flat for a long time, but so have civics scores, geography scores. They've either been flat or declining. There is a naturalization test that immigrants to the United States will take in order to obtain their citizenship, which is called the immigration test or the naturalization test in the U.S. There is an estimate today, based on surveys, that approximately one in three adult Americans who are citizens by birth would pass that test. One in three, okay? The test that's given uh, to individuals seeking naturalization into the U.S. Part of this, I believe, especially in the, in the past 15 to 20 years, can be traced about back to, I would say, 2010, 2012, under the Obama administration, where, again, there was a realization on the right and the left of the political spectrum that civics, in particular, the teaching about citizenship, responsibility as a citizen, it was in crisis. Those on the right and the left, they recognized that. It was a problem in the U.S. On the left side of the political spectrum, they decided that instead of teaching facts, dates, names, achievements, events, they would just skip that. Let's go straight to action. And they even called it Action Civics. There was a big report from President Obama's Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, about why we needed action civics. Instead of teaching students uh, the basics of our democracy, of representative government, of the rule of law, they're going to teach students how to be activists, how to go and engage the legislature or their lawmaker about issues uh, that were relevant to the day, right? So not why those issues mattered, They would just teach them that they should go and protest, right? So they skipped the part where they were equipping students with knowledge and information about how to be productive citizens and going straight to teaching them that they should walk out of school during the school day and protest or go march, right? They were even, in some places, being given academic credit for going to the legislature and lobbying, right? Going and saying telling lawmakers what they should vote for, uh, similar to the comments in the keynote, right, about um, uh, Greta and and, and what's going on uh, in Europe, but uh, very similar in the U.S. that now students are just being pushed pushed out the door to go be uh, activists. In Wisconsin, there was a report uh, from just a few years ago that chronicled almost uh, a dozen examples over the space of about a year or 18 months of public school students being led by teachers to leave their classroom, go straight to the legislature, and lobby for different causes. And albeit all of those causes were generally of the same ideology, right? They were clearly partisan and on the left side of the political spectrum. So it's not as though, you know, we're simply teaching students to go be activists and saying, you know, you can pick, you know, the right or the left to advocate for. It's clearly coming uh, from one side of the ideological spectrum. This has infiltrated into the classroom uh, in an even more nefarious way, if that's even possible, recently in something that is called equitable grading. Uh, This is uh, particularly taking root in California, and there they don't give students a zero if if a student doesn't turn in an assignment. They don't give them a zero. They'll just give them half credit, right? Uh, they don't deduct full points from a student if they don't, you know, complete something. They'll only deduct partial points, right? During the pandemic, and fortunately this was somewhat short-lived, although it's still happening in some schools, uh, during the pandemic they wouldn't even give letter grades, A, B, C, D. They, they wouldn't give grades, right? 
they would just sort of give pass-fail. Uh, and it was very rarely would, would fail even come up. Um, the issue was that, um, as I would argue, that this idea that if you tell a student that there is something that they have done wrong, or if you are not actively promoting their self-esteem, you're doing that student harm, right? When in fact you're crippling children, you're crippling these students if you tell them that their self-esteem matters more than what they can bring to their community or what you prepare them with to go on and be successful either in college or the workforce. Of all things, this has even found its way into math, even in math instruction. Again, it started in California where they have changed the topic from addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, they've moved it and everything is the product of white supremacy. And the purpose of math is to push back against uh, what they call the oppression based on racial class, right? So they've completely abandoned the idea that we are giving students skills that would make them more effective in the workforce and saying that their identity, their immutable characteristics matter more than their behavior and their decisions. The remarkable irony of this is America's sad history when it comes to the institution of chattel slavery in the 19th century, the failures of the Reconstruction after our Civil War, the Jim Crow era of laws that treated people differently based on their skin color, which we worked so hard to move away from, and then celebrated the Civil Rights Act of 1964 saying, that according to law, you could not treat someone differently based on the color of their skin. And yet, here we are, treating people differently based on the color of their skin. The irony appears to be lost on those uh, in K-12 schools who are pushing what they call equitable grading or equitable math. So, to finish where I began, that the problem began with a increased uh, involvement by centralized bureaucracy coming out of Washington, D.C., the problem remains there today because some of the attempts to deal with standards and civics, it's now coming from Washington again. There are proposals today to have a significant increase in federal funding, federal taxpayer money, on civics and standards. Now, the difficulty is, and I'm sure that this is common in, in the conversations that I've had uh, over the past two days, that interest groups are uh, so good at making their way into centralized bureaucracies and pushing to have their interests represented that they are the ones now behind the new civic standards. They are now the ones pushing for identity politics in the rejuvenation of standards in civics and math, and they have the ear of the federal government in order to do that. So what began with an increase in federal activity and centralized bureaucracy is now being, uh, it was com local lawmakers and local educators were complicit for decades, and now we come back and we are uh, left with the same problem of a centralized bureaucracy pushing the interests of special interest groups and somehow, in some way, moving back to an era where people are treated not based on their choices or decisions, but only based on their skin color. It's a very sad situation. So if there is any hope, and I will finish with this, if there's hope in the U.S., and uh, I, I used this phrase uh, just the other day when we were talking that uh, as conservatives, I think we are responsible for having a bit of sunny optimism about us when we talk about the future. There are parents and organizations in the U.S. who are creating new schools. Uh, while we find it uh, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to reform the existing assigned institutions, we're just going to make new ones. And we are creating new private school scholarship programs. We're creating new public schools. Uh, we are creating what are called micro schools, which, as it sounds, are small private schools that allow parents to choose how and where their children learn. They can pick the theme of the school, whether that be civics or whether that be math or um, uh, liberal arts. 
They are, we are creating new ways, and, uh, and we are determined, right? There are families, there are lawmakers today who are determined to create these paths for students to learn, even apart from the prevailing bureaucracy that continues to push these ideas that are lowering standards and are crippling students for the future. Uh, we, are, we are determined, and, uh, and I, would, I would say that you know, of our 50 states, our 50 laboratories of democracy, an increasing number of them are now adopting laws that allow parents to access a private school scholarship statewide, all over the state. Uh, they can access something that would allow them to choose something else for their children. So there is hope, there is a bright future, um, but that, uh, uh, that battle remains to be fought to resist the idea that individuals should be treated according to skin color. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have um, around half an hour to talk uh, between the panelists, uh, and then I will turn to the audience, so think of comments and questions as we, as we talk. Um, I actually think uh, I will start from the point that um, struck me in Jonathan's um, sunny ending, <laughs> to contrast USA to Europe. Uh, and this is a question for um, all the panelists, if you can just give a brief answer. Uh, I see a huge difference um, with this can-do attitude in states where we just set up new schools, new universities, we will have access to uh, scholarships. How are we going to deal with that um, in Europe where we have mul multiculturalism on one side and fragmentation of our societies and um, almost balkanization in some of the countries like France and Germany? Then obviously it's not so easy to access the funding. Um, um, and the, also the push from the technocratic elites from EU to actually erase our history, or if ever to look at our history, we should only see it in a negative light, that this is the source of our problems now, because it was a bigoted past, it was a past full of sins, sinful past. Um, so maybe, uh, Jean-Paul, uh, would you like to answer first, please? Well, uh, in France, we got five ministers of education in one year. Mm -hmm. uh, gives an idea of the problem. Uh, Do they, they all end up with a nervous breakdown after a few months? <laughs> uh, it's a, just an illustration of the Peter principle, you know. Uh, each of them uh, was nominated just upon his quality. Uh, they gave many uh, propositions. They have no intentions to respect one. Uh, it's just business as usual with a very deep uh, position of the syndicates, nothing will change. It will change if the government change. Uh, and if the government change, there will be a revolution. I promise you. Bye. Thank you. And Penny, do you think that maybe there is a chance that parents can unite above all the divisions that, in a sense, are perpetuated with these uh, multicultural um, laws that, in a sense, divide us between ourselves, but then parents have this need to, for their children to excel, to achieve, to have a better life than they had. So is there a chance to maybe unify the society, but also have this push for better standards and better schools? Yeah, I think, I mean, in the, in the Scottish system, you'll find that there are a lot of Muslim parents send their children to Catholic schools, and then Catholic head teachers struggle to uphold Catholic values because they've been edgy. So there's a, there's a kind of a strange mix of different people in different places. I mean, the thing that I find really fascinating is that... <coughs> particularly uh, on the issue of race, 
um, where there are a lot exa of examples of race being raised in primary education at the moment and parents reacting against it because they see it as unnecessarily politicizing uh, the school environment. Um, you will see parents of, you know, from all backgrounds saying that they don't accept that and trying to do something about it. And in Glasgow in particular, which is the most multiracial part of um, Scotland, the local government, which usually has no one coming to its meetings, has suddenly had this experience of parents from all different political backgrounds turning up at its, at its local uh, uh, monthly education meetings complaining about different areas of policy. So, I mean, I do think there is a universal thing, isn't there, regardless of what your background and identity is, that parents know that they are better qualified to decide on their children's outlook and moral values than the school. So even though we have a very strong tradition of people trusting the state to educate their children in Scotland, this sense of parents' um, need to assert their authority is, is growing. And I think that, yeah, there is a lot of potential for that to be a very strong mm. political force. Great. And Janos, I was thinking about the resolution that recently the European Parliament passed on teaching history in Europe and um, kind of um, dealing with uh, the petty national histories, kind of getting away from that and, and uh, trying to build this future uh, away from the problematic past. And um, how do you think that's going to affect the education in Central um, Europe, where there's this huge push from above and, and from the side as well with training, with student exchanges from Erasmus program to actually um, actively erase the history and only cherry pick and build a new, supposedly new brave world in Europe? I um, try to be diplomatic, okay? <laughs> so um, there will be two types of uh, Central European reaction for that. Uh, there are countries who are more silent and the diplomatic, they will sabotage this kind of process, of course, quietly. Uh, and the other, like Hungarians, we cannot um, shut up. It's a cultural thing. Uh, uh, we don't like noise, but uh, somehow. The communism, uh, the heritage uh, taught us to speak out. Uh, it's very uncomfortable. We understand, but we must speak. We will not only sabotage it, but we will, uh, we will protest and uh, we will provide alternatives. In, uh, I have a privilege to spend the first 30 years of my life in a system called communism, where we had nothing, just our culture. We were nobodies, no rights, no freedom, uh, no economic prosperity, but we had the culture. So we were immunized uh, uh, against this kind of uh, uh, this uh, uh, losing the identity and the culture. And I'm, I'm not talking about this narrow national culture things. Uh, I'm not a nationalist and we don't like them. Uh, European culture, it's, it's or Western culture, European is probably more accurate. And we will not let uh, to, to, to happen that and we will preserve the culture. Thank you. Um, and Jonathan, I was thinking about um, something that Frank quite often mentions, why the conservatives don't go into teaching professions, why they don't uh, pull their sleeves up, uh, take the lower pay, and also deal with realities of the bureaucracy and the technocrats imposing a lot of restrictions on them and burdening them unnecessarily, why quite often, you know, they have the um, the best in their heart for the students and for the young people, for the children. Mm. So um, would you have any proposals, solutions for that, how to inspire the conservatives to get their hands dirty and teach? Well, I think in the U.S., um, and, and like, you know, like I was saying, that the having conservatives go into the existing schools and change existing schools is very, very difficult because the teachers' unions, in particular, are very strong. Uh, they are, um, I mean, predominantly support the left side of the political spectrum. 
And so they don't leave a lot of room for those who think differently uh, to be active in schools at all. Um, I think that's why the creation of new schools has really been the solution that uh, so many have gone to. Uh, I would say as well that, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't believe that all teachers, well, I know that not all teachers agree with what teacher unions are trying to push today. Um, however, because the, um, uh, the unions and other special interest groups have so much control over the textbooks that are produced, the textbooks that are bought, the regulations that are passed by local you know, state departments of education, um, it's just very hard for a, a conservative who disagrees with the prevailing orthodoxy to say, look, I don't, I don't believe this is true, and to teach their students differently. Um, you know, that's uh, even that, you know, we relish the First Amendment to the Constitution in the U.S., right? The freedom of speech, assembly, and but even under that, uh, people are afraid to speak their mind because they're afraid of being shamed or, or guilted into, um, you know, some to, to simply say that they are guilty of something committed by someone else in another generation. So there's, there's this issue of guilt that they're, they're fearful of, and then there's also the established special interest groups that really don't leave room for conservatives. Do you think maybe we also, also should look into establishing um, unions that would support teachers no matter their political leaning, but actually to protect them legally, that they can teach and just do their jobs? Well, I think what few teachers know in the U.S. is that they have um, they have liability insurance already provided by a local districts. It's usually they're usually protected in their contracts as it is. They don't really need a union in, in many places, um, and so there. Are, I think the uh, public sector. I'm opposed to public sector unions in general because you have the, you have a group using taxpayer dollars to argue to get paid more taxpayer dollars, which I don't think that's really fair. So uh, I, I think instead, if we have uh, you know the ability of of, uh, of conservatives or any teachers really to organize and create schools on their own, I, I think that's really what's going to create the solution. And what's the situation with the unions um, protecting teachers in Scotland? Um, <laughs> the, the unions are very poor <laughs> in, in terms of protecting freedom of speech. The Free Speech Union is a good organization across the UK that is consistently defending teachers who, who get into trouble. Um, our union is not a, it, it, it has the aspiration to be able to defend teachers in the long term, um, but at the moment it's the beginning of an idea. But we like the idea that this isn't something of teachers against parents, that there could be the possibility of parents supporting teachers in their right to say something different. And how is it in France? Because also um, we are all aware that in France um, teachers are um, physically attacked. Um, um, Samuel Paty was beheaded in the street. This is a constant threat. Um, teachers were beaten up. Um, are the unions supporting them, or how does it how does it look like on the practical level? Because obviously we only get the gruesome news, but not uh, the day-to-day -day, um, activity and trying to counter what's happening. Uh, in France, the union gave, uh, gave lip service, just that. They want money, nothing else. Eighty percent of the teachers are leftists. Uh, uh, you must uh, understand something. The parents who attack the teachers are all Muslims. Uh, there was a scandal uh, one month ago because a teacher uh, showed a painting of the 16th century uh, about the story of um, Diane and Actaeon. All those remember the mythology, uh, the classic. And uh, uh, she was under attack because there was a naked woman, uh, mm. and it's against the Quran. Uh, I don't care what is in the Quran, but uh, the unions uh, and the actual minister, the actual minister, uh, two years ago, said they must restore uh, the penalty for blasphemy in France. Uh, it's against all the rules of laicity, uh, etc. But uh, we have a very 
very difficult situation. Thank you. I think we should open up to the to the floor. Um, ben, are you going to use the microphone? Run around. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nina Wolf, and I'm an independent researcher, and I'm also an author. But I'm going to ask this question as an American, as a New Yorker, to Jonathan and to anybody else who'd like to answer, on behalf of my niece and my nephew, James, who started school at the Cathedral School in Manhattan, which is a renowned school. and. Uh, they had to pull him out when woke started. He is now about to turn 10. And they he came home from school one day and said, Mommy, I think I'm trans. And my niece looked at him and said, Are you what what? And she she said, Would you please explain that to me? He was five, okay. And James said, Well, you told me you thought you might be having a girl. So does that mean I'm trans? At that and at that point, she just that was it. She waited till the end of the year, and she pulled him out, and he now goes to a Catholic school on the Upper West Side. Now, James is particular because he's not autistic, but I preface that because he is a math genius, calculating into things that I can't even understand yet, um, and she's been supplementing his education since he was five because he was reading, he was writing, and he was doing math where we had to do use calculators. Where does a parent go with a, with a child like this when education is dumbed down, as you're all saying, and she is, you know, she supplements it because his, he, there's nothing for him to do at school, really, except be polite and nice and make friends. He comes home, he does his homework in a quarter of a millisecond. So I, you know, I want to thank you all because I would like to know, and I'm sure if Juliana was sitting here, so would she. Where do I go from here, you know, with with an atypical child, um, who's uh, <clears throat> who's subjected to woke ed education? Thank yeah. You. So uh, give you. No, 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 the, and it's, I appreciate the background, and, and for the benefit of the audience, what's happening in the United States, schools are passing policies that say they can keep a secret from parents when a child comes to school and says that they want to, quote, assume a different gender. Now listen, individuals who are confused about their sex, they should have uh, sympathy and treatment. Well, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure, but my, my point just being that there should be, we should, we need to start with empathy. Like, I, I want to start there and, and not simply dismiss the whole thing. So, so, nevertheless, even if we start with empathy, um, saying that you can keep secrets from parents is absolutely wrong, and that is the place at which I believe that the, quote, new left and the woke uh, movement has gone beyond what parents are willing to stand for. Okay? And we're seeing lawsuits around the United States against these policies saying, no, you cannot keep secrets from parents about their children. So I'll start there to begin with. Okay, so secondly, so where does a parent go? Well, I mean, I think in New York um, there is a strong presence, especially in the city, of uh, charter schools. I think the Success Charter School Network is a very good one. I think highly of Eva Mouskowitz and what she's done with Success Charter Schools. Um, it's a shame that they are... You know, they're capped by space. They, have, um, they struggle to find facilities because they have to share space with traditional public schools in many places. But I would give you that at least. I think that charter schools are one, okay? Um, New York, unfortunately, is one of those states that is unlikely to pass a statewide scholarship program where a family can go and, you know, pay money uh, at a private school using, you know, scholarship funds from the state. But other states are. Um, in fact, there are nine states in the U.S. out of 50, granted, but nine states now where statewide a family can use a scholarship to send their child uh, to a private school. That is a trend that I don't see stopping in the future. I think we will continue to see state lawmakers enact policies that allow families to choose how and where their children learn. Thank you. I'm Joanna Williams, um, author and visiting fellow at MCC. 
Um, in many ways, my question follows on from the last one. I'd like to ask the panelists about elite education in their countries, uh, the very best schools, the elite schools, uh, because it seems to me that particularly in the UK, uh, the most expensive, certainly private, uh, we call them the public schools, they are really at the forefront of promoting woke ideology, if you like, of, uh, promoting the ideas of, around self-esteem, self uh, protecting self-esteem of children, um, promoting transgender ideology in the classroom. Rather than being a rebuttal, they're promoting these things. I think what's interesting is that these elite private schools are also at the forefront of campaigning against exams. You know, rather than being a defense for standards, which you might think these elite schools would be, they seem to be at the forefront of, of eroding standards. I think it doesn't really become that apparent just yet, because as you're pointing out, the parents can substitute in other ways in relation to their children's education, and good classroom teachers are still able to do their bit in terms of subject knowledge um, transmission in the classroom. I think in other historical contexts, a campaign to question exams would perhaps be less damaging than it is now. But when you've got standards spiralling, I think exams are actually maintain an important function. Thank you very much for all the panellists. Uh, it's been very interesting and, uh, and very sad uh, to be listening to all of this, although we're all aware of, of these realities. Uh, just one point, uh, we in Hungary uh, have passed a law um, to protect children from LGBTIQ ideology and, pointedly, to um, protect parents' rights uh, about their own children. Uh, uh, and this is a, a foundational um, and very, very important decision. We are uh, under heavy fire uh, and attacks from the European Commission, from... Uh, LGBTI groups, etc., uh, who try to portray this law as as uh, as an anti-homosexual law or anti-LGBTI law, it is not. It's to protect children uh, under 18 and to protect parents' rights about their own children. Now, my point that I want to make and and and, and question um, concerns well the crisis that you have all described, which obviously goes beyond education. Uh, it's manifested at schools and in this crisis, but it's, it's, it's deeper than that. It's about authority. It's about a crisis of identity, of self-defense, um, uh, and, um, and holding up some, some, some principles. And we've heard, some of you have said, especially from, from the States and, and Western Europe, that parents are now waking up. Uh, they are taking their children out of school. They take to a Catholic school, private schools. Well, those few who can... Uh, afford that or who can actually who have the opportunity to do it but that's not a solution to the wider problem um, is there not a danger that you will have these islands of resistance islands of walled in societies protect themselves but in the in the larger picture you're losing society you're losing the, the, the fight about values and you may not you know uh, you may not mind what's in the Quran but unfortunately your country is under heavily uh, under the heavy influence of it already, um, and now the the new young prime minister Atal is trying to, you know, put, uh, you know, portray authority and rules and etc. He was a minister of education before, I think, but really, can what can you do really to to gain back your own country, to gain back your own identity? Can you do it? Uh, Janos, my friend, said that we in Central Europe will hold on as long as we can, but th this is an onslaught. Uh, on, on a global scale. So what are the, you know, the chances? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Joanna mentioned the importance of exams and how they're being undermined. But I wanted to ask the panel about a point you raised, Penny, about teaching to the test. So 10 years ago, I went into teaching and trained as a teacher mid-career uh, and as a maths teacher. And I was, to be honest, quite shocked. I was perhaps a bit naive. Uh, and I thought that conceptual understanding would be something really important for maths teaching and helping students to understand the key concepts and build on them would be really, really important. And what I discovered was that for many teachers, actually, that was seen as a bit dangerous. You might confuse the students. And actually, it's better to teach them some tricks. You know, if you follow this, then do this, then do this, you'll get the right answer. So monkey see, monkey do. 
And when I said, yeah, but hang on a minute, it depends on the context, in another situation, that will give them completely the wrong answer. They would say, yeah, but they get it right 50% of the time. It e at least gives them a fighting chance. And so the thing that would seem to me is that the teaching to the test, which is rife. So, Janos, I'm quite interested in your opinions on this because uh, you, you, you talked about how things are different in Central Europe. And you talked yesterday in our private seminar about Chaucer and Chaucer not being taught. Well, my daughter studies at a state school and she's taught Chaucer in great detail. But they also teach to the test. So this is a good state school where they teach Chaucer, but they teach to the test as well. This is rife across British education. Um, so I'm interested in, A, is that an experience in Central Europe, teaching to the test? And from the rest of the panel, you know, what we can do to counteract that? There's quite a lot of uh, young people that also wa want to ask questions, so uh, hold on. Um, so any comments on the elite schools um, around the world that would be recommended? Let's keep it short because we have quite a lot to discuss. Um, elite schools provide absolutely no guarantee of, uh, of anything is uh, our experience in Scotland. So in fact, one of the women that's campaigned most vociferously on this issue, her child was being socially transitioned by one of the best schools in Edinburgh. She had um, referred the child personally, paid for them to go to a psychologist. The psychologist had agreed that they would not transition the child, that they would just let the child make their own decisions over a period of time. The school went against the psychologist and called in social services against the parents. So there's absolutely no guarantee that you're paying for it, that you're not that you're immune to the I ideology, and so um, thank some you, Penny. It's uh, worse. Janos. Yes, uh, for instance, um, MCC is a rather new elite school, and uh, we, uh, on the tertiary level, in higher education level, we work in the following way: we let the prestigious traditional universities work with these students, and they come uh, to MCC afternoon. They live together. We create a community, they have uh, general scholarships and, 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 uh, and credit programs, extracurricular activities and so on. So, if your elite sector is endangered now by Vogue and with other things, then simply you don't have to make a, a whole exodus from that, but create complementary things uh, where the content, the methods and the spirit of the institution is the right one. That's number one. And the second, we had a networking uh, event yesterday where all the Central Europeans, these new institutions, um, they were talking uh, about themselves and one thing was repeatedly mentioned, this is young leaders, youth, uh, future leaders of the country. So we are leaders oriented. Uh, if the current elites are in danger or in crisis, why don't you invest in the future leaders of the society, these young people who are sitting here uh, with the right attitude, with the right approach? Um, of course, we, uh, how do we know these kind of things? Uh, why do we take it so easily? Especially the typical Polish question, when the trade unions are the wrong ones, why don't you create a new one? Because this is what we learned when we, when we crushed communism. That if things don't work, make a new one. Why should we sit and spend so much time about the crisis when we can have the solution as well? So with the can-do attitude, um, any of the panelists would like to respond to the question on how to gain back control of the country, of the culture within the country, and this sense of unity? It's quite a challenging one, but I don't take no for an answer that is not possible. You need to come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll offer just very quickly, one of, one of the things that uh, we have to recognize that the other side sees this, sees this as well, and there's a woman uh, a professor named Robin D'Angelo. She wrote White Fragility, which is one of the books that has helped to accelerate the woke movement. But she actually, the at the center of her book is the term habitus, 
right? It's this kind of a shared cultural understanding of right and wrong. And she accused the United States of having a habitus that is about white supremacy. Like she went straight to the heart and said, no, no, the problem is that American culture is rotten to the core. So that is what we have, that is what we're up against, right? That's what we're trying to undo today is, to, is a, um, a more complex, but also a more uh, robust understanding that every nation has mistakes in its past, right? There's, there's every, every civilization has things that went wrong, but that doesn't define its future. And that message is one we have to give over and over again. And just as the Frankfurt School didn't overnight transform the United States, it actually took several generations and decades, I don't, I don't think that the restoration is going to happen overnight. However, I do believe that because the left now, especially on the issues of, quote, gender, has gone beyond what the American public is willing to accept, now is an opportune moment to seize this moment and say, no, no, they, they not only have that wrong, but they also have this accusation about the core of the United States wrong. They've got our national identity wrong, and here's what the real story is. And I think we have an opportunity to do that. Penny, did you want to comment? I'm a great believer in democracy as the, as the root to this problem, so I think it's great for people to set examples of how you might things do things differently, and I would encourage people to set up their own schools. But I think in the end, um, we need to... Yeah, I take responsibility for the world in terms of local government. For us, local government really controls what happens in education. And they've gone for such a long time without paying any heedance to what ordinary people think. They've constructed a new reality. Uh, and we need to, like, bring our... <laughs> parents need to bring their reality, what they love and what they don't like about education, into the public realm, I think, through, through all the basic democratic institutions that exist for us locally. Before I go back to the audience, and I saw um, Frank had a question, and there are questions on this side, um, I just wanted to ask about the, the standards, what Tony was talking about, but also extend it to what when the students leave, let's say Hungary, Poland, Central Europe, and they have to get to another institution around the world and progress in their careers. So how do we reconcile the rounded education with this teaching to the to the test to to the international standards. That's a general trend, of course, um, but uh, our systems are not so much uh, output oriented. Uh, also, there is process control, that national curriculum, the textbooks, and others, uh, because those who are not education researchers, if you measure the schools work according to certain way at the end, and it's a serious thing, like national testing and funding is depending on that and many other things, then it quietly starts to transform the content and the methods of education backwards. You start to teach uh, just to, 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 to look nice in the test, on uh, the testing. And the Anglo-Saxons are very much output-oriented. We, we have this uh, problem too, but we are also partly process-oriented. So there is a trust with teachers, textbooks are quite uh, knowledge-intensive, and the curriculum is very much uh, subject-based and knowledge-intensive. So the rot, the problem is there. Yeah, We share the same problem, but um, still in better shape. Thank you. Um, I remember there was a question there, please. One question there. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, I would like to thank the board for taking my question. I would, and I would like to ask each and every one of you to answer my question. So uh, for many decades, um, we have cemented the Prussian education system to be uh, the standard. In recent years, a lot of things has changed, um, except the education. For example, um, there was talk uh, about poems and um, books of poems. Uh, and that we don't consume literature and uh, art. But I think that's not true. I think the medium is different. For example, when VHS tapes became obsolete, we switched to CD players. And I think that's the case with mainly everything except education. A perfect example of this uh, was the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, where at least in Hungary, the education system proved unable uh, to reform to the current needs. So. I would like to ask you that how can we expect to have a conversation if we don't speak uh, the language of the other party 
and how do we expect to shove a VHS tape into a CD player? Thank you. Well, as far as I know, I, um, international and European uh, analysis, um, but that's a detail, Hungarian education system uh, coped with um, online education very well. There were big European failures. I don't, don't want to mention member states, but everything is relative. What does it mean uh, very well? And uh, the other thing is how can we uh, have a dialogue uh, with other approaches? Uh, I just... Uh, can tell that we are very happy to go into dialogue. What is, um, uh, I see two dangers in this uh, discussion about education. One is, this, as a general trend, is the polarization, political and cultural pol polarization of our societies, that we are living in bubbles, in tribes, and it's very difficult to talk with the others because they are living in an alternative reality with alternative concepts. This should be somehow uh, broken, break, and, and, and have a real dialogue. The other thing is, uh, which is uh, not the case here, uh, the postmodern media noise, which describes everything uh, in total crisis, and, and, and it's the clickbait culture which uh, raises uh, uh, non intelligent questions about education, and as the Chinese Zen masters would say, for uh, meaningless questions, there are no sensible answer like, can we start the school at 9 o'clock in the morning? Or should mobile phones banned from the classroom? You know, it's all contextual. These are meaningless questions. But this is what is about education, and uh, after a while people start to believe that this is educational discourse, although it's not. So, yes, we should uh, go into a better dialogue. My name is Andy Vermoot, um, and um, I uh, studied uh, late in mathematics wow. in uh, school. And now you said the standards are not changing. In Belgium, before, we had to uh, translate from Dutch to, to Latin and from Latin to Dutch. Now it has changed. It's only from translating from Latin to Dutch. So the standards are think, really going down. This is not the same anymore. We had also Greek before. Now in la Latin mathematics, there is no Greek anymore. So this is also going down. And now there is also artificial intelligence. And I see all the children using it. And they even have apps to, um, to, um, you, to hide it, that, it, that artificial intelligence is used. So what's your question on this? How do you see this uh, mm -hmm. future for uh, education? Let me mention one practical thing. I work with, uh, oh, sorry. No, I'm just checking if there's any more comments or questions. Here, yeah. uh, second row, please. <coughs> so um, <coughs> I want to go back a bit to Hannah Arendt and when she wrote um, uh, about uh, authority, what is authority? She wrote not only about education, a crisis of authority in education, but also in child rearing. So my question is a bit, uh, uh, for instance, uh, if, you, if big government looks at education and child rearing, big government will prefer education because then it's uh, easier to control the children. So my question is also a bit of, we, we're speaking here about taking back, back the state, but uh, I'm a parent with uh, small ch children. I'm thinking about uh, protecting my children. So my question is a bit, what is, uh, in your view, the, uh, the, the, yeah, the communication between r child rearing and, and child education and how we can treat it um, in, the, in the practical uh, uh, world we're living in. Any more questions, comments here, please? 
Hey, uh, I just wanted to add a comment. I'm Martin from Hungary, and I had the fortune to study at a German university uh, in, a, in a Erasmus program. And uh, that specific university was basically ideological uh, indoctrination cap, as I can say. Uh, we learned feminism, systematic racism. Uh, we had a uh, teacher. He or she was a queer, and he was uh, dressed up like a uh, Muslim preach imam. And uh, we also had a lecture what was called uh, a tribute to Tony Negri, uh, the irreplaceable lifeness of being a communist. So yeah, I really know how the Western uh, universities are, are working right now. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just struggling with that image there. Of the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I think, um, well, why are educational standards falling? I mean, that sneaks in a, 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 a presupposition, doesn't it, that education standards are falling? And we'd probably all agree in this room, or, you know, would be easily persuaded that they're falling. But I do think we need perhaps to think a little bit more carefully about how we answer this question, because if on the one hand we're saying one of the main problems in, in education is um, a problem of fundamental values of what we expect of education, what we want it to be based upon, which engages us at the deepest level in taking responsibility for the world and for what we do as educators, then we have to understand the limitations of empirical answers. So you're, you're kind of on the one hand, we, we find ourselves being very skeptical of PISA and testing. And on the other hand, we say, education standards are falling. Look, we don't study this. Or, you know, only 20% are getting this grade, right? We're undermining our own argument. So we need to think a bit harder about how to answer this question or at least approach an answer in a compelling way. And I would say to anybody who asks me that question, it's not a complete answer, but it's a pointer in something I think is worth exploring, is to say, look around. Look around your own society today. Who do you see speaking? Who gains, who gains a voice in public discourse? What kind of a voice is it? Is it a kind voice? Is it a tolerant voice? Is it intolerant? Do you agree with it? If you don't agree with it, is there anywhere in our society where you can voice your disagreement? Then you're asking people to engage with their reality, the world as it is, as Jacob said, and you're also asking them to make their own judgments. I think the empirical evidence comes in after that. That The empirical evidence will test your conclusions, but it's not the source of the answer. So that's my first point. It's kind of one we need to move towards using a new language with confidence about what it is we want to do in all things educational. The other quick question, well, it's not a quick question, but the question is about parents and parental authority. and. Um, Penny, I agree with you in principle. I've always felt teachers and parents should not be opposed, that they have a, a common purpose. But given the fractiousness and the balkanization culturally and politically today, um, are there not some prior common grounds that need to be fought for and won before that can happen? I'm Dennis Hayes, and in this context, I want to speak as the director of Academics for Academic Freedom. Um, one of the wonderful things about lockdown, from, from my point of view, was suddenly you had a, in universities a tutor and a class, and the tutors were frightened because they had to teach something. They couldn't do activities. They couldn't send you off and do group activities. <laughs> they actually had, and it caused a trauma for a lot of those lecturers who are used to, and particularly in education, where they send everybody to, to be a play games. <laughs> but I, I'm slightly worried about the negativity. We've only got two decades left, according to Janos, and we're all doomed. <laughs> and I think you're neglecting, <laughs> you're neglecting fundamental changes. And I've seen them because you know, I'm concerned about free speech. And, um, and universities should be the embodiment of free speech and academic freedom. But over the last few years, there have been tremendous changes. There has been a fight back. In America, just remember, have you heard of the Heterodox Academy? which is spreading groups everywhere to, to challenge things. This fire, which used to be the foundation for individual rights in education, has now become the foundation for individual rights and expression, and it's expanded. 
loads of groups, uh, free speech groups set up. There's uh, Free Speech Ireland, often by young people. There are academic freedom groups. Um, Penny mentioned the Free Speech Union. You know, got from nothing in three years to 13,000 members. And there, there are people actually having agency and challenging um, all, all the sort of woke orthodoxy. It's not just uncontested. It's fundamentally changed. And there are loads of, you know, there are loads of student free speech groups being set up. And you know, it's a sort of challenge to... Um, we had a, a conference with about 70 people talking about free speech in the UK. And some of the young people said, there's not enough young people there. Right? So they always <laughs> try. And somebody replied quite um, truthfully, I think, Unless the older academics defend free speech and academic freedom, there was no chance for the young people. So although it's nice to say, come along and do it, but if we don't, we don't take responsibility to do that, then everybody will lose. But it does seem to me there is agency now. There are changes all over the world, and, and I think something different is happening. And I'm more optimistic, because once you can have free speech, you can have debate about all these issues. Otherwise, you'll be running to solutions where... You know, you've not even asked the questions. Thank you. Just uh, one more comment or question, and then we come back to the panel. Thank you. <coughs> I'm a retired uh, teacher from Belgium here, and uh, I have two questions, but I will only ask one. Um, how dramatic is the decline in standards? This is uh, the, there is a decline, and I have experienced it myself during my career. But I think uh, at the end of the process, our doctors are still good doctors, our engineers are still good engineers, and if there is a decline, I think it's in the first place, in the cultural aspects, for instance, there is a, a dramatic decline in the historical knowledge, mm -hmm. also in the knowledge of literature and so on, uh, foreign languages. But in the hard sciences, uh, at the end, I think our doctors are good doctors, our engineers are good engineers, and our uh, computer scientists are good computer scientists. Thank you. So, shall we start from that question? Because I think that also is different between the countries. If we stand from this question, because I think that, that, that there is a huge difference between the countries, because from uh, my reading and hearing stories in states, actually the wokeism slowly threatens the standards of doctors and uh, engineers. So, um, uh, Jonathan, would you like to comment on that, please? Well, <clears throat> in the United States, we see evidence of the same um, a drop in standards in medical schools. We actually, you can look at uh, the textbooks and the materials being presented to medical students, uh, and you can see the same change in language in medical textbooks, right? You're there. In fact, the American Medical Association has redefined the way that you address a student. Uh, I'm sorry, address a patient who may be overweight. You can't say they're overweight. You you can't say that someone um, isn't taking their heart medicine. You have to say that you know, or can't access a doc. Like they're cha You can't even address patients in, in, you have to use this Orwellian language that takes away the responsibility from the patient, right? So I, I think it's, frankly, it's only a matter of time before we would begin to see that. Um, and uh, yeah, it certainly has happened in the legal field because, you know, that's where a lot of this critical theory kind of crept into. So I do think it threatens the important industries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now, going back to I think there's a crossover between your question on family, um, child rearing, education, and then Alka's comment. Uh, Penny, would you like to uh, comment on that, please? Um, I, d I, th I think it is really important that we talk to teacher training, to the teacher training process. And, and one of the things that's come out of this activism that exists in universities and then in teacher training colleges is that young people that are becoming teachers do not understand the difference between us handing over our children for knowledge to be imparted and, and our role as parents who take responsibility for the moral uh, judgment and the development of these uh, individuals and they've kind of got very confused about that and in Scotland 
education policy is now framed around that confusion. So I think either by setting examples, like saying this is an ideal classical education, or just by talking about it in the public realm, we need to re-establish the distinction between parents and children. And you're right, it, if I was in your position, I would be quite frightened about <laughs> handing over my young child. So then I think you just have to have strategies. And one of the best strategies, I think, is not to homeschool, although you could do that, um, but is to find other parents who also share your concerns that you can discuss those with and that you can raise in some forum rather than just uh, being particularly anxious about it as an individual. Thank you. And um, Dennis was talking about the fight back, especially in the Anglosphere, and uh, he gave a, a lot of examples of organizations that were set up, they fighting back, people are joining. Are there an example like this in France? I would like to respond to Sir Robert. Um, there will always Medicals, uh, engineers, okay, uh, five percent of the population. The problem is uh, mm -hmm. ninety-five percent. Uh, Thirty years ago, I worked with uh, Mayor of Balenciennes on the other side of the frontier. Uh, Toyota uh, wanted to install a plant uh, for the new uh, yards, I think. Uh, they have to choose between Germany, Scotland, and France. The Japanese choose France because they thought 30 years ago uh, the French worker had a better uh, academics <coughs> than the others. It will not be the same today. Today they will plant, uh, show, uh, they will construct their plant in Singapore. Know that? Yeah. That's really the declining of uh, the system. Uh, Penny wanted to comment. My son, quite uncharacteristically, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it, uh, for my f for my family, my son is doing a PhD in physics, um, and I f I find it very interesting because. <coughs> They have an incredible culture of discussion and debate within their discipline. Um, but they almost do that by being insulated from the world. And, and I, I found it, the further my son has got into depth in thinking about material physics, the more he's also really got into reading literature and looking for other things. And I find that they kind of have survived in their own little world sometimes at the highest level. At the lowest level, no, they're subject to all of the terrible influences. I teach architects, they're being told not to build. You know, so they're, you know, they're, but, but actually, you need, even at that level, you need the STEM sciences. He needs literature to make sense of the world and to find his place in it. So I wouldn't like count, counterpose them. We're okay here and we're not here. Janusz, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, this AI. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, maybe um, Peter Sange, that's an American management guru, was was died recently. He told once that culture eats technology for breakfast. So we have another project in MCC Learning Institute, the Learning from Asia in Education, and uh, I work uh, with an Asian PhD hub students. Very nice students. The Southeast Asians and the Central Asians and the Bulgarians and other, they use ChatGPT and they submit whatever the, the ChatGPT spit out, you know, as a text, they submit the thing. Uh, and we have also Chinese PhD students. They use ChatGPT to create something as a raw material. And once they have the text, they start to work on it better quotations, they change the content. That's just the first layer for that. That's cultural thing because uh, according to the Chinese mind, uh, you cannot be successful without hard work and pain. It's impossible, that's Confucius. So you must work hard. That's culture, you know? 
So I'm not afraid of that uh, if we have the right culture in Central Europe. And the second thing is I change my assessment system as a pedagogue. So if somebody submit a paper to me, previously I, I, I already evaluated it. Uh, in, uh, it's something, you know, like 10% uh, uh, or something according to uh, my uh, um, evaluation system. Now, if I get something as a paper, it's still nothing. I will evaluate the quality, but the existence of the paper means nothing because it is generated by the machine. You know, you, so you can raise the standards because uh, this uh, slave work can be done by AI, but not real intellectual work because um, uh, and that's my last comment. Uh, there are very few people who are, epistemologically speaking, idealists, like Platonists, neoplatonists. I am one of those persons. I'm not materialist as a scientific, academic person. And I think that only human beings can provide uh, abstract, high-quality ideas. And the machines can produce very good raw materials for the work, but nothing else. I think this is a perfect comment, actually, to finish on, um, on a higher note, idealism and, and the belief in the human high culture and us um, preserving it, celebrating it, and not being ashamed of it. So uh, uh, thank you very much to the panel speakers. Thank you to the audience for your engagement, comments, and questions. Um, big applause, please. And please join us for coffee, tea and cakes uh, in the foyer. Thank you.